Salt to water. Using glasses, not very good. Yeah, well, uh, well, good morning, and thank you for joining us in this virtual school board legislative delegation workshop. I'm going to introduce delegation members, um, uh, and I'm going to let it, all the delegation members give a little intro, and then I'll, I'll hand it off to Chair Barry. Uh, and also, anybody, anybody who's viewing this online virtually, thank you very much for joining us. I, I know we're living in a time of a pandemic, but we're taking all the precautions necessary to protect everybody's health and safety. So, Senator Berman, would you like to make a quick introduction? Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for putting this together. First, always happy to be at the school board. I'm Lori Berman. I represent the Senate District 31 which goes from Delray to Lake Worth, basically the ocean to the turnpike. Um, always happy to work with you all. I know there's a lot of big, big issues because of COVID that we're going to be discussing today and know that, that um, I sit on the education committee. So um, I will always be your partner as we move forward in the session. And thank you. Thank you, Senator. Before we go, go on real quickly, I'm Representative Dave Silvers, House District Peace represent Central Central Palm Beach County. Of Lake, uh, all of Lake Large Shores, all of Springs, um, parts of Lake Worth, and parts of, of Palm Beach. I go back to the delegation members. Senator Hazel, please go on. I thought she was on. But we'll come back to Senator Harold if she's able to log in, log in a little bit later. Senator Polsky. Good morning. Oh, go ahead, Senator. Senator, are you there? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I've had a hard time getting this. It's been a difficult morning getting this whole thing to work. Thank you, thank you for uh, getting me in. You're welcome. Would you like, like to make a quick introduction? Yes, I'm Senator Dale Harrell, and I represent District 25 which includes Martin and St. Lucie counties and in Palm Beach County is the western, the north, northwestern side of Palm Beach County, including Jupiter Farm and the city of Pahokee. And uh, Carrie, Carrie Lira and Karen Sweeney are my legislative aides, and Darlene Van Riper is my district aide, and uh, I believe uh, Carrie may be listening in. And I'm delighted to be here and hear all the, uh, the latest update on in legislative agenda. Thank you, Senator Har Harrell. Senator Polsky. Hi, good morning. Um, I think maybe because you all are in the same room in the school board, but there's some serious feedback. So if during the meeting anyone can manage that, that would be great. great. Um, so I am Tina Polsky, you all know me. Um, it's so nice to see familiar faces and, and welcome to the school board member Ayala. So happy to have you there. Um, and to the rest who I know all of you, and it's great to see all of you again. Um, you know, I am a uh, big supporter and a big fan, and I sit not only on education with Senator Berman, but also on education appropriations, which will be very important this year. And so I expect to be speaking with many of you throughout the um, session, and I look forward to doing the best I can to help fund public education as best, best as we can during these uh, very diff difficult times. So um, my di district is uh, in the Senate is, is both Broward County and Palm Beach. And in Palm Beach, I have, have all of Boca, western parts of Delray, Gordon, Lake Worth, Fort Wellington, South Bay, and Bell Glade. Um, so I, I also have with me on the call um, my three aides, Alexis Montalvo, JJ Fiscaldo, and Daphne Daniel. I thank, thank you all for meeting with us. I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Senator Polsky, thank you. Senator Powell. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Palm Beach County Legislative Delegation Hearing. I am Bobby Powell, Jr., State Senator representing Senate District 30 in Palm Beach County. Senate District 30 starts from the town of Beach, goes all the way over to the Royal Palm Beach, capturing all of the city of West, West Palm Beach, going north until we hit the Martin County County line, including Jupiter Beach. We go to Cuesta, Riviera Beach, Lake Park, Magonia Park, and all parts in between. I'm excited that you joined us this morning. On this call with us this, this morning from my team uh, is Mr. Christopher Stubbs, Mrs. 
Diane Andre and this is Kirsty Miles, the team that is on a GTJD, get the job done. And we believe that that life of service is a life that counts working together. Also, believe in collaboration is greater, greater than competition. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Casello, Vicki, do you know if he was able to make it up? Representative Casello, are you available? No. Okay, we'll move on. If Representative Casello is able to log on later, we'll give him a, a moment to introduce himself. Representative Hardy. Hi, thank you. Uh, I am Representative Omari Hardy. I represent District 88 in the Florida House. Uh, District 88 goes from South County to North County. It encompasses Delray, Boynton Beach, Lantana, Lake Worth. West Palm Beach, Riviera Beach, Mangonia Park, and Lake Park. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to serve, um, and I'm going to have, uh, I think, a lot of fun working with you guys who uh, serve on, on the school board as a former classroom educator and as a son of three, three generations of educators for me. Um, public, public education is a priority of mine, so I very much appreciate the hard work of those of you who work with the uh, school district. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Skidmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Skidmore. I represent District 81, which is uh, west of the Turnpike, Boca Raton, Del Rey Beach, Boynton Beach, Lake Worth, a tiny bit of Wellington connects out to the Glades area, so the seats of Mahokoki, Bell Glade, and Fay. My legislative staff uh, are uh, Rob Mariaga, Terry Mitzi, and Dr. Rob Reese. I'm looking forward to um, hearing presentation today. Um, my focus has always been on health care, um, so I am not on any education committees um, this uh, session, but um, certainly am devoted to defending and protecting public education in the state of Florida and everything I can during the appropriations process to be there for you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Slosberg. I'm Emily Slosberg. I represent House District 91. Boca, Delray, and Boynton. My legislative staff is Ed Soule, Jack Anderson, and Francine Bacon. Um, one of my priorities has been safety, especially for our, our students. So I look forward to, to working with school board on safety, keeping our students safe. safe. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Rep. Snyder, I don't believe is on. Is he there? No, okay. Representative Wilhuff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm here, although I'm not in the video, which is probably better for everybody anyways. Um, I represent District 86, which is, is between Wellington and West Palm Beach and along the uh, in between. Two kids in the school school in February and February. You know the prior education. Um, but I just, just I can't go here, which is I can go $1.7 billion for all of our budget already, but uh, we will fight for everything that we can for you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Hopefully, uh, as I continue to mention, we may not be able to see each other as much in person in Tallahassee, but there's uh, two wonderful aides, uh, Tom Valio and Paul Santoro. So thank you very much, Hunter, for everything you're doing for uh, our students and our parents and teach Palm Beach County. Thank you. Thank you, delegation members. And uh, before I, I hand this off to Chair Barbieri, I just want, want to take the opportunity to thank everybody for attending today's virtual. I know we like to be doing this in, this in person, but we're going through some new, new times now in a pandemic. So I appreciate your patience with all of our technical issues on whichever end it may be coming. So I uh, appreciate your patience with that. Uh, uh, Chair Barbieri, School Board Chairman Barbieri, School Superintendent Fenoy, and School Board Board members, Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for taking the time for today's uh, meeting. Uh, Chair Barbieri, would you like to have some comments, and if you would like to make some introductions for the uh, school board members? Yes, thank you, Chair Silver. Uh, Mike, can you share your screen? Sure. So on behalf of this fellow, my fellow members on the school board, the superintendent, and other district staff, and it's, I want to thank Chair, Chair Silver, Vice Chair Russo, and the entire Beach County delegation for meeting with us wow, today. That's really bad, bad feedback. Yeah, hopefully it'll stop here. 
I'd like to begin with a quick overview of our district. As you may know, the Florida Department of Education recently released graduation rates. As a district, we increased from 91.6% in fiscal year 19 to 94.4% of fiscal year 20 at district-operated schools. We are 90% when you include ch charters. We offer students more than 330 in career programs, all designed to engage students and set them up for graduate success. Bring that feedback on your side. I'm on March 13th of last year when we closed schools. Mike, I can't hear, hear you because your feedback is really bad. Uh, hold for us a minute. We're trying to fi figure it out. Can you hear us? Mike? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. You. Can you hear it now? Can you can you hear us? Chair Chair Silver, can you hear me? Um, I'll text her. Yeah, to give her Catherine Benton's number. Who? Catherine Benton. Call Dave Silver. Hey, I hear you. You can hear me. Good. I can hear you now. I can hear you. Okay. So we're going to keep going here, and hopefully it'll not do that again. On March 13th of last year, when we closed schools and temporarily shifted to distance learning for the, for the remainder of the school year, we immediately began providing lap laptop computers to each family that needed one in order for, for students to receive their lessons. Actually, today we have, we have achieved a one-to-one -one ratio of students in need of a laptop. We are working with the county to provide an innovative Wi-Fi mesh network to, to provide families with connecti connectivity. We are the 10th largest district in the United States and the largest, largest employer in Palm Beach County. We serve roughly 170,000 students in grades K through 12. Most importantly, we're committed to academic excellence and equity to help each child reach their full potential. And that's a brief overview. Mike, next. To say this has been a difficult year, year is an understatement. We many challenges lie ahead during, during the upcoming legislative session, and your continued partnership is much appreciated as we work together in service of the best outcomes for our kids in Palm Beach County. Next, Mike. Before I turn it over to Dr. Fanoi, I want to give fellow board members an opportunity to introduce themselves. I just ask everyone to keep it brief so we can allot most of our time today to discussing legislative priorities for the upcoming session. Mrs. McQuinn. Thank you. Good morning, all. I am uh, representing District 1 for the Palm Beach County County School Board. So to give you my boundaries, I am, I, I am south to, to North Palm Beach, Plate Boulevard, north to the Palm Beach County, Mark County line, we all now know as County Line Road, west to the acreage, and east to the Atlantic Ocean. Very quickly, then, the, my municipalities are North Palm Beach, Palm Beach Gardens, Juno Beach, Palm Beach Shores, Jupiter, Jupiter Inlet Colony, and Tuesta. I'm very happy to be with all of you. Thank you. Mrs. Ayala, Ms. Ayala. Good morning, delegation. It's great to see all of your, your faces and congratulations to the new member of the legislative delegation. I look forward to working with all of you. Um, uh, my name is Alexandria Ayala and I'm proud to represent District 2 on our school board. District 2 encompasses Central Palm Beach County and includes parts of West Palm Beach, Green Acres, Palm Springs, Cloud Lake, Lake Worth Beach, Lake Clark Shores, and Haverhill. Uh, thank you all so much for the opportunity to share our thoughts with you as we head into this, this legislative session that will be one of the most important of our time. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to represent District 3. I am mostly an un unincorporated board member, so I have a teeny, teeny piece of Lake Worth, and then I have Boynton Beach, Delray Beach, and I go down in Boca Raton to the north, north side of Clintmore Avenue. Basically, you can think, think of me as your Cobra and Delray Alliance school, school board member. It was a wonderful blend of, of senior and young families. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, my pleasure to be here today. My name, my name is Erica Whitfield. So nice to see everyone. Um, I represent District 4 on the school board. 
Um, that is West Palm Beach down to Del Rey, west to Military Trail, and east to encompass all of Palm Beach Island. Um, and then there's a section down the middle that's Dr. Robinson's. So um, quite a big area, and it's just such a pleasure to work with you. And I thank you for making an education a priority um, this year. I think we're going to need your help more than ever. So I'm looking forward to working with every one of you as we work to try to repair some of the issues that have come up as of, because of code. Thank you so much. Mrs. Andrews. Microphone, Mrs. Andrews. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with Palm Beach County delegation. And I'm Marsha Andrews, school board member, District 6. And I am your Western Community Board member. My district uh, uh, starts at West Lake Worth and moves right through uh, Wellington, Royal Palm Beach, Loxahatchee, all of Acreage, West Lake. Arden, and every bit of the glades. It's my pleasure to have the board member for over 10 years, and I want to thank the delegation for all of the work you've done for District 6 and the entire school, school board, and especially your initiatives that you've done over, over the years for West Lake Educational Center. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dr. Deborah Robinson, proudly representing the children and adults of District 7 for 20 years. Um, District 7 is the urban corridor uh, going Lake Park to Delray, Ray, for the most part east of I-95. Um, and I thank you for li listening to our concerns. Thank you, colleagues. I'm Frank Barbieri. I represent District 5. Um, my district includes uh, all of, the, all of the, ten, the 10 schools inside the city of Boca Raton and the 11 schools in the area they commonly referred to as West Boca. And again, I thank, thank all of you for taking the time on busy schedules to meet with us today. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge the lobbyists that are working for, for the school district, Ron LaFace and Megan Fay from Capital City Consulting and Ms. Rita Sol Solnet. They will, they will be working with you up in Tallahassee and here locally to ensure, ensure you have everything you need during legislative session as it relates to the school district of Palm Beach County. Finally, finally next slide, Mike. Finally, I want to highlight the district's overall legislative platform for the 2021 legislative session. I understand you can't read that, but the superintendent will be covering those shortly. We did have some minor revisions, which, which were approved by the school board yesterday, but district staff will be, will be sure to share the updated documents with you if, if they haven't already. As a reminder, even though we, we will be discussing a few top priorities in depth today, the, the platform will guide the district's overall advocacy efforts during the upcoming legislative session. Next, Mike. Excuse me, Mr. Back one. In addition to our platform, the school board has adopted issues of continuing concern for 2021. Again, this document was shared with the delegation along with our main platform back in November. We have since added a priority related to seeking FY22 legislative appropriations for projects related to West Technical Local Education Center, the African American Museum at Historic Roosevelt High, and a community-based post-COVID acceleration plan in partnership with the Urban League of Palm Beach County. On behalf of the school board, we look forward to the discussion with our Palm Beach County de delegation today. I will now ask uh, Dr. Dr. Fenoy to walk us through the legislative priorities for this year for, for the delegation. Good morning, Chairman Silver, Vice Chairman Caruso, though delegation and school board members. <clears throat> Let me first start off by echoing Chairman Barbieri's appreciation for the, for the opportunity to present the school's legislative priorities for the, for the upcoming 2021 legislative session. For the past several months, I've been able to provide regular updates to the, to the delegation during scheduled calls organized by the wonderful Ms. Nolan. I was also able to connect with many of the delegation members via one-on-one -on -one phone calls during the months of November and December to highlight the school board's re recently adopted legislative platform. In addition, we share our weekly, weekly Friday Five messages with elected officials to keep them in the know. It's important to me and the school, school board to keep, a reg keep in regular contact with the delegation. We know you are fighting on behalf of the students and staff of Palm Beach County, and, we're com and are committed to getting you, we are committed to getting you the information you need to maximize your advocacy efforts and inform your decision making. I'm happy to start off today's meeting with news that two of, two of our top priorities back in November were heard by the Com Commissioner of Education. The Florida Department of Edu Education I issued Ex Emergency Order 2020-E007 on December 7, 2020. 
which address our COVID-related legislative priorities concerning FT and parent choice. On behalf of the board, I want to thank Commissioner Corcoran and his staff once again for providing us with these assurances for the remainder of the school year. Next, next slide, please, Mike. All of the legislative platform and issues of continuing concern documents list all of the school board's priorities for 2021. We will use our time with the delegation today to share our most pressing issues we're currently focused on. This includes priorities related to, one, assessing student learning in light of COVID-19, two, addressing the base student allocation and required local effort. No school closures, Mike, the next, uh, Mr. Berg, the next, next slide, please. We know the school closures back in March of last year had a profound impact to student learning. The situation remained fluid when the current school year started back in August. Although all students began the year in distance learning, brick and mortar campus campuses did reopen in mid-September as per direction we received from the Florida Department of Education. Public edu education continues to face COVID-19 related challenges on a daily basis. And we know the situation is far beyond our local community of Palm Beach County. School districts across the nation are still trying to adjust to this new normal. And with every COVID spike, many parents remain understandably reluctant to send their children back to brick, brick and mortar. Approximately 43% of our student population opted for face-to-face -face learning and our most, most recent Make Your Choice window parents and guardians. Due to the under impact COVID-19 may have on student achievement school year, we are asking the legislator to refrain from using FSA and EC exams as high stakes tests. We understand that the exams must and should be given to students to assist with progress monitoring efforts. The added pressure of tying scores to promotion and retention decisions, in addition to teacher evaluations, puts a heavy burden on our students and school-based staff. We are also asking the legislature to consider the use of alternative assessment options, particularly for those students whose parents do not want them to returning to school campuses due to COVID-related concerns. Right now, parents who have opted to keep, to keep their children in distance learning physically bring them back to brick, brick and mortar campuses for testing purposes. Again, again, our legislative platform outlines several more priorities for the upcoming session. However, with the end of the school year qu quickly approaching, assessments are definitely to mind. We would like to use the remainder of our time today to discuss priorities related to, to K-12 education funding. At this time, I turn over, our, turn over our presentation to our CFO, Mike Burke, to speak finance-related legislative priorities. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. I uh, appreciate this time today. And I also want to echo the sentiment that uh, we appreciate our local delegation. Uh, things don't always go our way in Tallahassee, but we, we know you guys are there supporting us and it's greatly appreciated. Uh, as Dr. Noy mentioned, uh, Governor DeSantis, Commissioner Corkin really uh, uh, held true to their word to uh, protect education this school year. And we're, we're hoping it will continue uh, we recognize that the legislature has a difficult challenge ahead of them based on the state rev revenue forecast. It looks like you're short about $3.3 billion over the next two years, and as much as $2.75 billion of that in the upcoming FY22 budget year. And uh, while the challenge is great, we just have to reiterate that the, we must continue to try to prioritize education. The challenges we're facing as a school district have never been greater, and uh, funding is a key piece of that. We, we know we've got in loss. Uh, so social emotional issues and just the increased operating cost of operating schools during a pandemic. I'm going to get more into that. That uh, Dr. Fenoy really covered this. this those executive were key to this school year and, and really allowed us to, to run our schools. Had, had we not been held harmless on our enrollment, we were down about 7,300 students that were actively trying to re-engage and get back in school. But that normally would have cost us about $60 million and had been would be devastating uh, to the current year budget. So I can't say enough about, about those executive orders. They, they really went a long way uh, to protect us. COVID, uh, we, <laughs> operating our schools during COVID is extremely expensive. Uh, you know, we received our first round of federal st stimulus dollars, the ESSA dollars, and we will spend above and beyond that allocation. Uh, we, we had about $35 million in total that paid with our district schools, and our costs just related to PPE and keeping schools clean, clean and providing gloves to our employees, you know, you know face masks, enhanced cleans, uh, all, all the things we're doing, changing the air filters and air conditioners. Uh, it's a long list and I won't read through it, but we expect to spend 45 million. So we're actually gonna spend about 10 million more this school year than we received. And the, what's not even included in that is push to get computers in every, every student's hands. We went to a one-to-one -one device ratio this year 
We expedited that in our capital bill budget program and spent $25 million to purchase about 80,000 computers. And uh, we worked quickly to get that done. There was a great demand for computers across the globe. And uh, we were able to accomplish that in relatively quick order by being active. Other costs related to COVID, and you're probably hearing this, but school food service programs across the country are being decimated. Uh, those programs pendant on the number of meals they serve and the federal, federal reimbursement that comes along with that in the, in the, in the, in the revenue if, if, if students are purchasing lunch. But our revenues are down about 50% this, this year, and that's, that's roughly $40 million. So the, the money adds up quick. And uh, you know we have a, a, a great food service team. They are working harder than ever to try to meet the needs of the, our fam families. They're providing grab-and-go meals, giving kids meals at the end, the end of the week for the weekend. And over Thanksgiving and winter break, break, they sent meals home with the students. So they're doing, doing everything they can to get the meal service up, but with, with a good portion of kids still learning from home, uh, we're just, it's just possible to get, get to our normal numbers. Uh, our after-school care program, which is important, important to the community and our employees as well that need child care for their, for their kids, uh, that's, that's a fee-based program, and what's happening is the, the numbers, numbers are down, and we, we need to keep those programs running, and there's just, we, we've lost the economies of scale, and those, that program is, is hemorrhaging money as well. And then, then unemployment costs, this was kind of surprising because we've worked hard not to lay off any full-time full employees, but we're seeing a spike in our un unemployment cost, and uh, we're working with the state to try, to try to sort through that because we're really, we're contesting some of those claims that we don't feel, feel we're... Uh, but anyway, uh, you're seeing that across the state as well. The, uh, the recent good news uh, with the recent passage of the additional round of stimulus funds uh, for schools, you know, a big package, but uh, it, it was certainly welcome news, but I want to be careful not to let people th walk away with the impression that, that this, this solves everything. Uh, you know, Palm Beach County is going to get a, a, a nice chunk of these monies, about $156 million is our latest best, best estimate. But we've got to make those funds last for two years, likely. They've got to get us through FY22 and 23. And we have a, a staggering loss, a learning loss. We must be addressed. And there's requirements that come along with, with these funds. So we've got to really work hard to try to, to catch the students back up and to make up for this almost you know, like, a, like a lost year. So there's going to be a lot of demands on these, these monies. And there's also uh, states that receive monies are under requirements uh, to maintain their funding level for elementary, secondary, and, and high, higher education. We're going to look at what the state did, did in FY17, 18, and 19 to gauge that. So it's important that the state resist the temptation to uh, you know, try to use this money to fill a, fill a hole, you know, help fill some of that $2.7 billion our hole you're dealing with, because uh, you, you could jeopardize the eligibility of these funds. And we have a a lot of work to do uh, to meet the needs of our, of our kids. So these monies are badly needed, and it's not just a question of getting our schools back to normal. We have to get back to normal and, and then go you know, 20 extra yards or more to, to try to catch the students back up and uh, be reactive to their social and emotional needs as well. So we do have our priorities. Uh, we would like to, to, you guys will do your best to try to increase the base student allocation by $100 for the upcoming year. Um, it, it looks like the FRS, you know, this past year, the FRS rates, the employers paid up significantly. That cost us about $15.5 billion, rough, rough, or close to $16 billion. That's expected to, to occur again for the upcoming year. And it takes $75 increase to the BSA just to cover that rising cost of the FRS. I think it's a good thing to try to, try to keep the pension fund solid. I think that th those increases in the employer, employer rates are important, and we support that on behalf of our employees. But we just don't, don't want it to be an unfunded uh, increase. We'd like the BSA to, to offset that. And we do have other rising costs. Property insurance is going, going through the roof, as you probably all know. And then just kind of normal rising costs of inflation and uh, other materials we need. We're going to talk a lot about the RLE. I, you may recall a couple of years ago, I did a presentation to this delegation. I said, RLE, find out what it means to me. And it, it's, still, it's still critically important. So I want to get in. And then the teacher salary. You know, that, that was great. The, the governor's legislature did $500 million. You guys, guys provided the increased teachers' starting salaries, and we have done that. We've reached an agreement with our union. Uh, but there was kind of an intended consequence that uh, has now compressed our salary schedules, and it's a great, great concern to our veteran teachers that have dedicated their lives to the, the profession, and now they're 
seeing their salaries just slightly above that of a brand new teacher. So this is one of my charts I update every year. And despite our best efforts, you know, Florida's heading in the wrong way in terms of our national ranking and funding per student. We've, we've fallen to 46 in the country. That's down from 30, 36 in the country in 2007. And the, the, we're, this RLE thing I'm going to talk about is important because that's a piece of that. And as long as we've kind of prioritized tax cuts and, and not allowing the tax rate to kind of grow or stay the same and then let the revenue grow, property values increase, that's, I think that's a real root cause of why Florida continues to slip in the national rankings. And our, our funding increases are just not keeping up uh, with inflation and rising in cost. So, you know, 46 in the country, is, that should get people's attention. You know, we're, Florida has a strong economy and really feel like we could, we could do, do better. You guys probably, probably know this well, but in edu Florida's education is funded by chain sources, local property ta taxes, and state sales tax primarily is your, your main general revenue source. And of course, the sales tax is the one that was hit by the uh, pandemic, but, but it is re rebounding remarkably well. Uh, the local pro property taxes seem to be holding their own. Uh, you know, there's some concern about commercial property, but in the short term, uh, while we expect the growth probably won't be we've seen in years, we've, Palm Beach has been growing to about 5% a year. That could sit slip maybe down to one and a half or 2%. We're not, we're not sure at this point. But the, uh, the residential market's really holding its own. It's the commercial property that's the bigger concern. So the RLE is just, it's, it's really a cornerstone of the FFP funding formula. And back 2016, the, the basically under uh, then House Speaker Corcoran's leadership, uh, we started this practice of rolling back the RLE to the rollback rate. So basically when the property value values went up across the state, the tax rate was reduced, so you bring in the same amount of money each year. You don't really benefit from that growth that a city or a county government would. But if they maintain their tax rate and they see increased property values, that typically gives them some more revenue to work with. Uh, education was kind of held back from allowing that to occur. And as a result, we're seeing a greater, greater dependence on state revenue to support education. And now when you, you hit in a situation like this pandemic and sales tax are then you know you're more even. It makes it more diff difficult, right? Because you're more dependent on the sales tax revenue, and um, you don't don't have the benefit of prop local property taxes to, sh to shoulder some of that uh, recession. Just to get into that a little bit more, if you go back to Y16 when you, this start started, you can see you know in FY16 the hourly ta tax rate was just under five mils, 4.984. It was bringing in about seven seven point six million, and you I'm sorry, seven point point six billion and stayed at that level for three year, years, you know, to a dollar. And then, then the, uh, the legislature allowed us to start capturing the benefit of new construction, and that they allowed the RLE to grow, grow a little bit just in the way, way just offset for the new construction, allow us to get the benefit at, because new construction comes with, you know, brings more demands for services from schools and local governments. Uh, so that was a good thing, but we'd like to really consider just allowing the RLE to grow, you know, stay the same rate and grow with any property value we increase we get ne next year. And uh, if you look at funding over this time span from F FY16 to FY21, so that's six years, our, our base student funding has grown 3.97% over six years. And our, and our total funding, which includes categoricals and uh, the teacher raise and all that, has grown just under 10% over six years. Which is, you know, that's nice to have any growth, but it's 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 not a huge amount when you consider 10% over six years. Years, you know, that's less than 2% a year. Anyway, you're probably getting getting tired about the RLE, but again, this shift, this holding back of the RLE, has really shifted the dependence on on education funding. Uh, back in FY09, the state funding share was at almost 48% versus 52% local. That's kind of flip flopped to where now the state supporting 57% of education and local share is about 43%. The, uh, so just a few more things to consider. Uh, you, know, you know, we don't roll back the sales tax when the prices of goods or services go up. Uh, the RLE, we, you know, if we were able to leave it in place, we would have benefited during the good times when property, property values were going up and our state would be in a stronger, stronger position to withstand these downturns in the economy. Uh, so the, uh, the RLE and the kind of the constraints that's put on teachers, our funding has really, 
until recently, that really held back teacher salaries. And we saw our teacher salaries fall to the point to finally, you know, it got a lot of attention. And we appreciate the governor getting time to raise that starting teacher salary. Uh, but that, you know, could have been, been avoided, basically. And that's why you see the teaching profession fall behind policemen, firemen, EMTs, that type of thing. Uh, so anyway, and then if you just look at Florida, you know, our investment in education as a state is 2.7% of our gross domestic, gross domestic product. That's, that's well below the national average of 3.3%. And we look, we look at Florida having over a $1 trillion gross domestic product, ranking making fourth in the United States. If, if we would, could, could just bring ourselves up to that national average, uh, that would bring $5.8 billion more, or a 26% increase in the K-12 education. And that would bring Florida well out of the bottom of the rankings. Uh, so anyway, that's just, you know, that's a lot about the RLE. We just wanted you, just want, just want to stress that because again, it, this is really what drives a big, big portion of our funding. And now that we're heading into some tough, tough times, it's a time to really rethink that. Uh, let's see, I had another, I think we may have skipped over a slide here. All right, so we talked about teacher salaries at the start, and I want to just, just kind of illustrate what I mean by salary compression. So this table shows you kind of pre and post House Bill 641 and the 500 million that went out to help starting teacher salaries. And it did provide 20% of that money did go to veterans. Uh, and we supplemented a little bit of that money this year to get our veterans a 3.5% raise. But we were able, because of that uh, legislation, we, we raised our starting salary from $41,000 a year to 47500 So that, that, that's one, it's almost a 16% increase for our newer teachers. Uh, the downside of that is when you look at our teachers, uh, and say from five to nine years, they are ma they're making just under about forty-seven thousand dollars for House Bill six forty-one, and at that point they were about fifty-nine hundred dollars above the starting salary or fourteen percent. And now with the implementation of House Bill six forty-one, their salaries have gone on up a little bit. They're up to you know forty-nine thousand one hundred thirty-eight on average, but they're they're only sixteen hundred thirty dollars now above the starting salary or three percent. And then in the 10 plus year category, you can see where the 10 plus teachers just used to be, you know, 41 percent above the starting salary. That's fallen to 26 percent. So we're, the teachers kind of ever in the later years there are, are feeling a little unappreciated. <laughs> and uh, anything you could do this year uh, first to maintain that money so that we can, you know, we've awarded those salaries, so we've got to obtain that 47.5. But we would like to, if we get it to go back and do a little, little more for the veteran teachers. That would be greatly appreciated. And that concludes, concludes the finance presentation, Dr. Pinoy, and uh, we're ready for any questions. Chair Silvers, if you have uh, questions on side, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to run it down uh, down the, the roll. Um, I'll go up alphabetically like I started, and, and still looking, I'm actually still seeing, seeing the Q and A from Mike Burks. Computer. Yeah, I'll stop yeah. sharing here. Okay. Senator Min, do you have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been around and I know the whole rally story. I was just, just wondering, and I, and I agree with you, we have to do something to help the schools on the RLE issue. Is there any, what is, what is the feeling that you're hearing about, um, this year, has leadership said one way or another what they want to do about RLE? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't heard anything this year, but it's been pretty consistent for the past, you know, five or six years that that was of a non-starter and that the RLE would continue to be rolled back, except for the value of new construction. Uh, but we're hopeful that maybe that, that decision will be revisited in light of the budget challenges this is facing. Right. Yeah, no, I just wondered if there had been any, you know, discussion either way. We had any hints about what, which way we were going. But, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll to, going to continue to work and try and support you on that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Berman. Senator Harrell. Okay, we'll move on to Senator Polsky. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that presentation, and, and it makes a lot of sense to me. 
Um, I have a couple of questions. For the RLE, what, do you have an estimate of what it would cost an average homeowner in raised property taxes to get the RLE increase you're looking for? It's, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not overwhelming the average taxpayer. It, it could generate a lot of money wide, you know, it could generate close, close to $500 million to keep it in place uh, uh, for the upcoming year. And, and that's dependent on what we see with property values. Um, the, the average homeowner varies across the state. I, I, you know, I'll follow up with a more formal answer, but I'd say roughly about $50 on your average home. $50 a year? Correct. That's remarkable. Um, well, we certainly know how each county is willing to pay it as we have in our, uh, you know, our uh, referenda. So, um, yeah, if you could give me that, I mean, to show, show what a small amount it is per individual for sort of an average home, home price, I think really drives it home and say, oh, it's a huge tax increase. It's, it's really not. It's, um, so that will be helpful to me. With, with um, I don't know if you can see this yet, yet with property values, but we all know in, in Palm Beach County, at least, there's just been such a huge uh, rise in well, Karen Brook can speak to this as a real, you know, the, the um, desperation to houses here and the prices have gone up. So do we, would that help with any kind of estimation of how um, our property values or our taxes will be in future, future years? It's definitely uh, the housing market anchoring our property values. We... Normally, we, we've been growing over 5% a year, as I mentioned. Uh, I think that the housing is helping the office. What we're going to see is a decline in commercial property value. People, there's less demand for office space, there's yeah. small business closing. Uh, uh, in Palm Beach County, if you look at the tax base, about, about 80% is residential and about 20% is commercial. So I, hopefully there's enough growth on the housing to offset that 20, 20%, you know, the 20% that's going to be hurting this year. Uh, but I'm expecting uh, where normally we'd see 5%. Our latest estimate was maybe only just a 1.66% overall increase in property values for Palm Beach County. And, you know, I, I, that's going to, we'll know. I mean, they'll take their, you know, it's going to be based on uh, this past January 1, 1 the values of January 1. I know the property appraisers got a lot, a lot of work to do to figure that out. Okay, so you're not, we don't know yet. Let me just we don't, we don't know moment. really for sure, no. Okay, okay. Um, and my last question has to do with um, CARES Act funding or future funding that our new president Biden, so, so happy to say that, um, is going is, is going to propose. Do you have any idea how that might help the district? Um, you know, looking at the numbers that he proposed so far. Sure. So the the first round of stim stimulus that we received back in uh, March or April. Nationwide, it was $13.5 billion. And at that point, the, the Council of Great, great State Schools, which is a great organization that represents 75 of the, the largest districts across this country, they, they did an estimate. And it really, if you really want to try to try to help education, you need about $200 billion. And, you know, if you, if you, if you go back to the Great Recession, when we had the ERA, ERA funds, which is the American Investment Recovery Act, that, that, was, that provided about $100 billion for education. So, First round of stimulus really wasn't, wasn't expected to go too far, and then we got the the, the second round provided uh, about about 52 or 53 billion. It basically provided about four, four times more than the first round, so you know that that's great. It's going to go a long way, uh, but it's still falling short. In an aggregate, you know, when you add those together, together you're still you're less than what was provided during the era, and you're still considerably less than the the estimate of the 200 billion that be needed needed nationwide. Uh, those monies do come with requirements, you know, and there's going to be a lot uh, potential uses for those funds. And uh, President Biden has, uh, I've seen, you know, he's got a proposal that uh, that's uh, going to be released soon, I guess, and, and it would provide more money for K-12 edu education. I believe it provides another $130 billion potentially to 12 education. Okay, well, I look forward to continuing to speak to you. I'm sure you know um, for the community. So uh, thank you so much for all that and to all of you and um, see you all soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Senator Powell. Thank you, Chair Thilbert. Um, a couple things. One, um, I want to talk about 
this investment, we talked about a $5.8 billion or 26% increase in K-12 education. Uh, would need, be needed to bring our state to the mean of a 3.3% uh, investment. Where would that put us at on the scale in terms of we, we are now 46 uh, nationally in ranking for education funding? Where, where would that bring us to? It should put us right in the middle, you know, around 25, you know, 25, 26 in the country. Like that. It'd move us about 20, 20 slots in the ranking, you know, hopefully about get us in the top 25. In okay. Uh, the other question, and, and I know we talked about a lot of the uh, funding being specifically garnered uh, for a lot of these tax cuts that we do here in the state of Florida, which, you know, even after this pandemic, I think, you know, we know we're going to go to Tallahassee and probably come up with some kind of tax package um, where, you know, a lot of these funds should be uh, spent to keep us really afloat in terms of public education and a number of other, other things. Um, what do you see as something that, um, other than us continuing to advocate for additional funding, other ways that we could uh, help the system being that we're in the midst of COVID-19? Uh, and, and in addition to that, i got another uh, issue, too, but um, other ways could we as a delegation can help? The, you know, another, outside of revenue and more money and trying to find new revenue streams, like, you know, on, online, taxing online net sales or to, you can work a deal out with the Simple Gaming Pact or whatever. But instructionally, you know, the superintendent laid out some things. Uh, one thing, you know, we're hopeful, you know, that the vaccine is widely distributed and next year is a no normal school year. But there's a chance that we, that we could still have a portion of our kids that want to stay home and learn online. And this, this year, part of the flexibility that was granted to us allowed us to still get funding, even if those kids, kids were in virtual education uh, and learning, learning from home. And I'd like to see that continued for, for at least another year, because uh, we may just have some families that aren't quite ready to come back to brick and mortar buildings. And uh, if, if, we ha if we're forced to treat them as truly, truly virtual students, then we normally lose about 20% of the funding that goes along with those students. And uh, that, that's one of my concerns. So if we could continue to kind of extend those executive order orders that gave us some of that flexibility around innovative learning, uh, I think that would be a nice kind of safety blanket to have in place in case, you know, God forbid, we're not in that great a spot next August, yes, or September, and, you know, the, I, I think that goes without saying. We, you know, we still have some families that, are, that want, want to stay home. Okay, okay, last thing. Uh, two weeks ago, myself up at school board, uh, Dr. Deborah Robinson had a conversation. We were brainstorming about how we, we could get uh, – the vaccine to our honorable teachers who would be over the age of 65 who have to inter interface with kids on a daily basis. How can we be as a delegation? We know that we're hearing, hearing a number of things that the vaccine will be available at, at pub Publix, but how can we delegation work with the school district to make sure that our vulnerable um, teachers are taken care of? Senator Powell, this is, this, this is Donald Fenoy. So I think one of the things that you can do to help think right now the supply and Supply chain issues are real, as you know. Um, but logistically, uh, we've been talking to some folks around creating that opportunity for our, our teachers 65 and older. So any support that you can do um, on, on the county level, uh, getting those, those supplies in, um, logistically, we can set up the, the mechanism by which to distribute it. But right now, just getting, the, the, getting, getting a dedicated supply for our um, employees, not just our teachers. I think, I think that's another important distinction. Our employees who come in contact with students who are over 65, which, which would include our bus drivers and this guidance, because there's, there's, there's a group of people that we can bring to that. So any advocacy around just, just getting us a supply, helping us uh, be able to distribute that, because if we set it up for our, our groups that are, that are 65 and older, when the supplies are more frequent, then we can have the infrastructure to, to, to provide opportunity for all of our, our employees who wish to be vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Fanoy. And, oh, and excuse me on my, my misspeak, because uh, Dr. Robinson, when we have spoken, has always made sure to say school district personnel, I think, right, Doc? She's in here, here somewhere. But okay, that's what I need to know. We good? Senator? We are good. All right, thank you, yes, sir. Representative Hardy. Representative Hardy. 
Yes, yes. Um, first off, I want to thank Burke for the presentation that he gave. Um, Mr. Burke, I first met you several years ago at a meeting of the Coalition of Black Student Achievement and you gave uh, a presentation um, pretty much expressing the same things that you're, you're expressing right now, which is that the legislature is not uh, doing right uh, by our kids, by our school district employees, by folks who uh, believe in public education here in the state of Florida. And, um, you know, I would go up there and you use uh, that argument that you uh, I mentioned about you know you know how we don't roll back the sales tax rate uh, when the price of uh, good goods go up there, but uh, you know the fact of the matter is I want to give bad actors any bright ideas. So um, you know you know I think we'll we'll all um, do our best to advocate for equitable funding of public education, and um, it's just unfortunate that we're going to uh, have to go go up there and fight for it the way to do so. Appreciate that. I appreciate the work that Powell and Dr. Robinson, um, you know, are doing to try to make sure school district employees who, who have been forced back into uh, our school centers um, can have access to the vaccine. I think that's extremely important. And I'm uh, looking forward to uh, work, working with you guys to get things done for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hardy. Representative Skidmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not, not sure who exactly to direct my question to. Could be Dr. Fenoy um, or possibly the uh, lobbyists uh, uh, lobbyist that you have on um, contract with. But can you explain to me just very basically what your strategy will be um, for ending the rollback of the um, required effort? and I ask that so that I know how I might be able to help support you in that, but I don't know exactly what your process is for making that happen other than it being mentioned that you think because of um, the budget crisis that we're in that it might, might be easier to get past this year. So what are, the, are those efforts and, and is there anything that we can do, do to help support them specifically? Mm. I'll take a shot at that. The you know you know I think we're first trying to raise awareness. Uh, you know, tax cut down great. You know everybody everybody likes tax cuts, and this is kind of like a under the radar tax cut. When you when you roll the roll the, roll the RLE back each year, uh, to the rollback rate, technically if you're just bringing in the same amount of money as the year before, uh, that that's that's not a tax increase. And, so I argue that's not even a tax de decrease. That's that's just going back to the rollback rate, and you're seeing the status quo. And we're just trying to inform people that, that that's that's not really how it works in other government agencies. You know, the and I'm a big fan of the county. They have the their their county commission has authority to set their millage rate. rate. So if they want to maintain their millage rate, and they've they've, they've kept a, con a constant millage rate, you know, just under I think four point. Eight, eight mils approximately or so. They've been steady with that mill, millage rate. And what that allows is in the property values go up a percent, they've got a little, a little money more to work with to meet the needs of your constituents. So if the sheriff has a budget request that's critical, they've got money to work with to address it. School districts have been kind of hamstrung from that. And what you've seen as a result is many school, school districts have gone to the voter to pass local referendums. And you've got, you've got over a third of the districts in the state now that have gone that route. But that's that's a little di dicey because then you know you've got to go back to the voters every four years to maintain that revenue stream, and should you lo lose it, you've become heavily dependent on it. We got that money paying for, for over 750 teachers, <laughs> and, and uh, half our police force and our mental health work workers, uh, so that really should be necessary. And I think, you know, I would just try to raise awareness that this is a when the state and the legislature is looking at budget choices and they're they're trying to deal with this shortfall that. They say, look, we need to first try to see if there's any way we can bring in more revenue. And, and this is a tool to, to, to allow that, that the relatively, you know, it's not a huge impact on the, on the taxpayers. It's, it's uh, so. Mike, I can chime in if you don't mind. mind. Um, help me out. Represent, <laughs> no, you do a great job. But um, our, our, our wonderful uh, lobbyist, lobbyist in Tallahassee from Capital City, um, Capital Consulting, Ron LaFace is on. So if Ron, if you want to add anything to what we're presenting, the time, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Dr. Fenoy and Mike. You did a did a bit of great answer because it is really at this point around awareness. Um, what, but what we are doing and kind of the strategy that we've been working on for you know, about two or three months now 
is is really in the RLE increase to the increase in the Florida retirement system costs. As Mike mentioned earlier, the Florida retirement system does need to have um, these costs in order to maintain its uh, its its well funded um, status. But but that cost is about seventy five dollars per student. We need at least seventy five dollars per student just to not be a budget hole because of the FRS costs. And read the FRS costs are about about as low as the state can do in order to keep the bond uh, and rating agencies happy with the pension fund. So we're going to have this seventy-five dollar uh, FRS increase, um, but we and then we begin to talk about in the full value of the RLE and not roll, rolling it back. And that's the only way that the state in, the, in this in this situation has the ability to offset this cost that it's just giving to school districts. So that's really the strategy um, and the conversations we've had thus far. There's a lot more receptiveness to this in that leadership. Um, um, so I do think that we'll probably see some movement on the RLE. Um, it, on the Senate side, that the House side is still continuing the same, um, at least their, their opening position is going to be to continue the same policy of just taking advantage of new construction, but rolling back the remainder of the RLE. And it's going to it's going to end up being a budget conference issue, I believe. Um, and so you know, the more that you can educate members of your uh, of your caucus and um, of your cha chamber, the, that's what that's what we need. And Megan and I will certainly be right there for you and we can presentations to the caucuses or or meet with members is the plan that we have. Just raise awareness so that everybody understands the RLE helps helps offset legitimate costs that districts have, particularly around the Florida retirement system. Thank you so much, Dr. LaFace. I appreciate that explanation. Look forward to do what I can to help uh, get the word out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Osberg. I don't see Representative Slosberg. Is she on the phone? May have lost Representative Slosberg. I'm going to go to Representative Wilhite. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. In your yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all, all the school board members for the work that you continue to do. Um, had a couple of questions, obviously, so you're dealing with uh, one, if you could answer for how your school safety is going. And working working with the officers, obviously, with uh, with everything throughout this pandemic. Uh, secondly, if you could talk talk a little bit about maybe how you're utilizing the additional sales tax Palm Beach County agreed and approved, uh, whether you're using that capital projects, uh, whether uh, or maybe the COVID products you're using partially in part for that. that. And uh, I guess that's it for, for the moment. I did have one more question. I'll think, think about it in a minute if you could answer those two. Well, Representative Wilhite, I'll start with the sales tax question. This is Mike Berksipo. The, you know, we went to the voters. Uh, we had a long list of projects back in 2016. And we, we are, we, so we made, it, voters approved that uh, sales tax along with the county and our city partner, partners. Uh, we, you know, we made the promise, we had a long list of projects, and we're, we're st sticking to that list. So we're working through um, the bulk of that money, uh, the school district's going to receive about $1.3 billion over 10 years, and about a billion of that's going to just deferred maintenance to, you know, these are, these are projects like roofs, HVAC systems, uh, security projects for school campuses, you know, single, single point of entry. Uh, but we had enum enumerated everything we were going to do with those monies before it was passed, so it's really a question of, of sticking to that plan. And... You know, the sales tax was really necessary because we lost 25% of our, our local taxing authority for capital projects during the, the Great Recession. And we used to be able to levy two mills for capital projects. And, and, and in 2008, 2009, that got reduced down to 1.5 to 1 mills. So that, that's what, that, that, we were hoping that was a temporary thing during the recession, but it's been left in, in place ever since. That's by the time we got to 2016, we had accumulated this large backlog of maintenance projects that we were not able to fund because we lost so much revenue. Uh, and that was really the impetus for that for that referendum in partnership with the county. So that that's going very well. And even with the, uh, the uh, pandemic and the the dip in sales tax revenues, our collections are still on pace. So we're we're, we're very very pleased with that. The the one challenge we have is the co cost of construction keeps going up, and so uh, we're working to to just try to overcome some of those challenges. Uh, but the program's doing extremely well, and that'll wrap up in 2026. In terms of your question in reference to school security, um, 
Ms. Paul, please chime in if, if, if I leave anything out. Um, but currently, we are, we have, we, we're no longer dependent on our um, contracts with other municipalities and other, in the Sheriff's Department. We are fully, fully staffed in our schools with uh, school police officers. Um, we have our uh, security details and other troops have now been outfitted with the necessary equipment that they need to respond to active shooter um, and is issues. Also, the, the training, training in the police department has increased to such that, you know, de-escalation. Um, and then also the mental health side of the police department has grown. Um, and then currently we're just dealing with, you know, and, and galvanizing quickly around in any sort of uh, local or national effort. So Chief and his team have worked well on that. So again, all our schools are covered with police officers. We actually even are able to coverage as people are out on quarantine and other issues. Um, Naturally, because we have less school, I mean, students on campus, we haven't had the same type of issues that we've had in the past. Um, kids who are on campus are very thankful for being there. <laughs> and now the threat of going home for a loud conversation causes behavior to change very quickly. Uh, but Ms. Paul, if there's, any, if there's anything you'd like to add on behalf of the operations team. Dr. Fenor, I think you've pretty much covered every, everything. We, as everyone knows, we pretty much doubled the size of our police force. and. Chief Kitzrow and his team have done an outstanding job covering our schools. I'd just like to add. Yeah, I, I was just, I want, I want oh, go ahead, sorry. I'm just going to say for, for both those, those referendums we have in place, we've got independent citizen oversight committees that meet quarterly to review how every dollar is spent so that we assure them that we keep to our promise to the voters. And both those programs are going, going very well. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, I was just making sure in my assessment on, on the school safety is, is obviously because whether COVID had hit your officers or if you had a uh, concern about officers, you know, being short because of COVID. Uh, but the, the last thing I did remember, remember my question was, is, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about uh, obviously COVID testing, uh, uh, schools, nurses, kids, other health and different things. Um, um, I, I'm wondering how, if you've got up to your full, full nursing staff, and our previous conversation was, is it just being true and on transparent with parents, parents who do have kids in school, and so that you know this is such a, such a health risk to their kids, let alone the secondary aspect of to our to our teachers and, and parents, that um, how, how our school nursing staff is going, and that we are how it is working out with the parents and students, uh, in combination with potentially already underlying healthcare risks that the children have or their, their that they that, that they have or that their parents are concerned about. Thank you, Mr. Ch Chairman. Thank you. I think it's just, just yeah. yeah. I mean, I would just share. We have a great partnership with the healthcare district, right? That provides a nurse for every school. There, when we started the school year, I know there were some vacancies, and I think think they've done a pretty good job of overcoming that. Uh, I don't have the latest numbers, but uh, they're just a valued partner, and uh, they've been a, a, a key 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 ingredient to getting schools back open. They've uh, helped helped us with testing. They're administering rapid testing in our, in our schools as needed, and uh, you know they seem to be doing a good job. The only thing I, I would add back to the safety, I think the legislator, you know, having an officer in every school is mandated by the legislator. Um, Palm Beach County, but they don't fund it fully, so it's, it's the taxpayers of Palm Beach County that have allowed us the opportunity to put an officer in every school. So I think in terms of a continuation in the legislative party, if you want school district across the country, um, unlike Palm Beach County, who has you know, great citizens who have voted for these tax referendums, at some point the legislators are going to have to look at costs of prov providing an officer in every school. And for Mr. Oswald, if, if there's anything to add in terms of the school nurses, you can add that at this time. Yeah, there's just a couple vacancies. There is some turnover that they've been having. Also, in our alternative education programs, they do share, but they do have, do have a, a number, like an on-call type of service to provide that support. So again, we're, we're very fortunate here in Palm Beach, as Mr. Burke said, for that partnership and the work that they're doing. Uh, they're giving daily updates on just the work that's happening in our schools. Okay, thank you very much for that. All the, the explanations, the presentations, and taking the time to answer the questions and concerns of the delegation members. Uh, we got one more time before we, we, we call the we call the meeting. Senator Harrell, are you on, on the phone, or Representative Smith Salzberg? Nope, nope. All right, I try. Uh, well, thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to thank the uh, school board, Beach County, uh, Dr. Fenoy, and 
uh, all delegation members for conducting this meeting virtually. Uh, I, I know, we know we'd rather be doing this in person, but obviously for, for public safety reasons, I, I, may, I thought it would be smart to have this virtually. So thank you very much. Um, and, and we look forward to Friday in Fort Beach County and the school board. Of, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Polsky, do you have a question? I do, if you don't mind, thank you, Chair. This is a little unrelated to our to topic, so I waited till then. Can you just give, give me an update on the uh, school calendar for 2021-2022? What your thoughts are, about, please? Start date specifically. Yes, ma'am. As of right right now, um, the recommendation that I've made to the board is for uh, August 10th start date. Uh, the board start, decided last night they were to postpone that they had a few more questions, and we will bring that recommendation back in February. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, okay. Well, thank you much for attending virtually. Uh, virtually. Oh. Chair Silver, I have at least one board, a couple board members here that like us if we have any time left. Yeah, yeah. Make a few comments. Sure. Sure. I didn't, I didn't know if anybody had any. Oh, go ahead. Say Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herman. Uh, Chair Silver and the, le the delegation, I wanted to bring something to, to your attention while I have you that also has to do with testing. Um, but this particular piece is about our access testing for our e ELL students or our English language learners. Um, as many of you probably witnessed in your own communities, our communities of color are struggling more than any other community with the COVID pandemic. And part of that is not coming into, into schools to ensure the safety of not only themselves, but maybe, maybe the family members they reside with, the siblings they take care of, and, and the other duties that they have in their everyday lives. So the access test, which is um, administered in paper form, has a speaking component, which has happened one-on-one -on -one with, with a teacher. And you know, we, we, I, there are other petitions going on around the state, particularly out of Miami-Dade and Orange County, where there is Hispanic representation on the school board boards are uh, advocating for this because students are primarily, um, you know, we, the, the overwhelming majority of our EL students are first generation immigrants of color. So there's a lot of pain, agony, and trauma that's been experienced over the last year. And I think that any assistance we could, could get from the delegation, not only on the whole testing piece, but on not feeling our children, uh, having our children forced to come back into to brick and mortar to take a test when that isn't um, really, really required. We're required to give it. They're not required to take it or at least postponing it or working with us on when we can plan to administer it virtually would, would be really appreciated because I've heard many concerns from my community on that and I wanted to make sure it was on all of your radars. If you have any specific questions on the test or any of the procedures as I, that I have the answers to, I'd be happy to help or get, get those answers for you. So thank you. Vice Chair Brill. Brill. Thank you. And so I know all of you will be able to, to read our priorities um, that you're not, not able to see on your screen, but they do include several non-financial priorities. And one I want to just quickly bring, bring to your attention, one thing we learned with COVID, we all knew that Palm Beach County is not, not Leon County and that our counties are, are all different. You know, obviously COVID-19 hit Broward, Miami-Dade, and Palm Beach, Beach County much harder than the districts up north, north of us. And what it did was it really magnified the issue of home rule. And so one of our priorities is to clarify um, the authority of the local education agencies during a state emergency to have the ability um, to be able to, um, to make their own decisions. And yet another way of looking at that, although the executive orders have been very helpful, you know, we still have very high numbers here in Palm Beach County, but we could not meet with you virtually because there's no executive order to allow us to do so because this would have violated sunshine for us. So I just want to bring that to your attention. I know that local rule has been an issue with our state. Um, it is impacting us even more this year during an, an, an emergency like this. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and, and Mr. Burke uh, mentioned it a bit, but I want to, want to kind of make a, a real emphasis is the money coming down from the federal government. It's really, truly really important that uh, it's not uh, magnified at the state level to be used on other things because this uh, 
this learning uh, gap that we have, this unfinished le learning, it's going to take about two years for us to just try to get back to the level with, with our, our students as to where they were before the pandemic. We're going to have to be thinking about extended summer schools, extended days, uh, weekends, tutoring, um, just uh, so, so many things that will have to be different that's not a part of the normal budget that we receive from the state of Florida. And so, yes, I'm hoping that we are going to get the additional money from uh, the, the federal government, but the monies that we're get, getting, it has to be really looked at. I mean, to say you got uh, this pile of money and got two years, and then, then the state says, uh, we want to use it for something thing else because you haven't used it yet. It's going to take, take some uh, time to, uh, to assess where, where our children are and all of their individual need, need, more manpower, more everything, more curriculum tools more time using the buildings in a diff different way. It's going to be two years of making it work to get our children back to where they were before this loss. And so when we begin to talk to you over and over again, we'd like to let you see our plans that we'll develop here in Palm Beach County with the money attached to it to, to let you know if we're gonna bring our kids back out of this pandemic to success, we need your support and you've always been there for us. So we thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Um, I'd like to echo Ms. Brill's uh, comments on home rule. I think um, that's something that, that we really need to see um, here in, in Palm Beach County as we go forward as crisis. It, just the ability to make decisions is huge. Um, so I, I thank you for considering that. But um, one thing I think that we really do need to, need to put an emphasis on right now is our voluntary pre-K programs and how we really help our children to be set up for success. Um, the, the opportunities to really focus on that, I think with the new, new federal administration are gonna be big. They, they understand the needs. So hopefully we can start use, using that pressure from both sides to help the state to realize the priorities that need to be there for our stu students so that they can be ready when they come into our, into, into our kindergarten school classrooms. Um, ready to learn, ready to um, already understanding the, the basics of reading and numbers. So if you can th think about how we really prioritize those children, uh, that would be a wonderful thing. It's on our priority list. And um, I really think that we can make some movement on that this year. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you guys do for us in Tallahassee. We really, really appreciate it. Sir, sure, sure, I just have one, one more comment from our side I have to make. Um, it's been, it's been uh, mentioned about the, uh, the, the uh, Home rule. One of the issues that we have is uh, we there are construction oversight review review committee oversees its 14 uh, independent citizens that are independent from the school district. They oversee the construction projects that the district engages in, and we, you know they oversee hundreds of millions of dollars worth of projects each year. They've not been able to meet for three months because some of those members that are very instrumental in making sure that everything is done exactly the way it should be done are in their 70s and 80s, and they're afraid to come into the room with 14 people and, uh, and the public that are allowed to come to those meeting meetings. We've asked um, through through the, our lo lobbyists to get to the governor and ask for him to extend in the executive order that would allow him to meet virtually, and, and we've been told uh, no. So whatever you can do, we're trying to figure out what's to meet quorum requirements uh, so we can have these, these uh, very need necessary committee meet on our, you know, to make sure the school board and the school district is spending money wisely, uh, but we're not able to do that because they're not allowed to meet at all. At all. Uh, unless they have uh, all the boarders present, all the committee members, members in the room. So whatever you can do to help us with that issue would be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for voicing your concerns on that and we'll, we'll take up this time in Tallahassee. Take it up with the governor's office. Uh, I see Representative Stu Moore did have a question for school board member Ayala. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, clarify that you're saying in terms of the, the assessment that one-on-one -on -one actually is being interpreted as face-to-face. One-on-one -one cannot be one-on-one -on -one virtually. Is, is that correct? None of the tests can be taken virtually at this time. All students okay. are co coming back in for testing. Okay, understood. Thank you. I just wanted of that course. clarification. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Skidmore. Um, I see that Representative Slosberg is back. We lost her, but I see you back again. Can, can you hear us, Representative Salzburg? Yes, yeah, my internet has frozen out. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about, about 
student city as it relates to traffic. Uh, a few years back, I want to say thank you to school, school board member Bill. We passed out that 1-800, how's my driving on the back of school bus? That was an idea brought to, to us from a member of the Cobra community. So, so thank you for that. Um, last session, or two sessions ago, we passed hands-free in our school zone zones, which, you know, everywhere else you can't check drive, but in our school zones, it's hands-free. Um, this coming set, that, or this, this last session, we passed legislation that would double fines for, for overtaking a school bus. We've had some serious is issues. The Department of Education has reported over 10,000 drivers overtaking school buses when, when students are getting off and the long arm is out. Um, this coming session, uh, Senator Berman and I are going are filing legislation that, that would allow school districts to opt in and have school bus cameras that could capture these drivers overtaking our students. This is um, incredibly important um, um, for the safety of our students, our vulnerable students getting on and on and off the school bus. Um, I look forward to working with, with the school board member on these issues. Chair Silver, uh, we have one more more board member over here I'd like to make a comment, Mr. McQuinn. Just to quickly clarify, uh, uh, under our platform, I'm dealing with the addressing the effects of COVID-19 and following up with the, the previous comments from my, my colleagues about the in-school testing. Put in lay layman's terms, we ha have, what, over half of our kids virtual right now who have not been in a school center, brick and mortar, this year. Well, since, since March, asking them to come brick, brick and mortar and having schools prepared to receive them in brick and mortar, six foot social distancing, et cetera, for the sole purpose of standardized testing is going to, in, in anybody's point of view, is going to seriously negate what information we can get from that testing. So we're not asking that they don't test. It's the brick and mortar, a, a situation that the kids just are not accustomed to. Remember, we're starting at third grade. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the delegation? Or is everybody okay? Okay. Well, thank you very much for attending today's virtual event, virtual meeting. Uh, again, we had some technical issues, but it looks like we've got, we, we're going to make it through okay. Everybody stay safe and um, we look, look forward to working for you, uh, Tallahassee, and with you down here. Yeah. So thank you so much. So if thank nothing you. further um, for this delegation, Senator Berman, please be adjourned. Thank you.